morning to our colleagues uh, and uh, good afternoon to our colleagues in Pakistan and around the world. Uh, I would like to formally open this uh, event for today. It's one health event. And uh, we have a quite jam-packed agenda for today. Six speakers. And speakers uh, from the UK, from Pakistan, and from Turkey. So uh, without taking much uh, of my, uh, time, I'll just introduce myself. My name is Khalid Mahmood. Uh, I am uh, the co-founder of UpSign Network, which is a UK-Pakistan Science Innovation Global Network. And this network was established in the UK three years ago. The whole idea was to connect the researchers from the UK and around the world who have interest in Pakistan. And we work in four or five areas, uh, primarily in agri-food. And secondly, then we work on health. And the uh, third area is of interest is education and knowledge transfer. And fourth area, we are working on renewable energy, clean energy, and uh, water. And the fifth area is uh, AI and uh, big data science, so which has application across all the sectors. So I won't take that long, but I'll just uh, go to our uh, today's chief guest, Honorable uh, Professor Iqbal Chaudhary, who's the, the coordinator general of uh, Comstech, this uh, international organization, which is set on the OIC. I'll just hand over to Professor Iqbal Chaudhary to say welcome to the participants. Over to you, Professor Iqbal Chaudhary. Uh, thank you very much, Khalid Bhai. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, I know that there are many uh, very distinguished speakers uh, who would be speaking on this very important topic, but I'll just briefly introduce you to uh, Comstrack. Comstrack is standing committee of 57 ministers of science and technology in OIC countries. OIC is the second largest group of countries after the United Nations. So it's a very important uh, in institution and instrument through which uh, Pakistan worked together with 57 uh, member states. And we are delighted to have a very active collaboration with UpSign, thanks to the efforts of uh, Professor Dr. Khalid Mahmood. He has been instrumental in uh, organizing very large number of uh, these events and every one of that was extremely meaningful addressing uh, a very pertinent problem. Uh, the one we have today is extremely important. Uh, this is uh, a major departure from very uh, focused approach of human health and taking uh, different components separately. I think this is uh, something which we need to cherish in the context of COVID-19, where we have seen there was a global failure of uh, science diplomacy, science and technology cooperation. I think in, the, in this context, this topic is very, very important because this is interdisciplinary, it is multi-sectoral, and uh, it uh, takes health in a very different perspective. So I greatly appreciate that. Comstech has initiated lots of program in the field of health sciences. Uh, you may like to visit Comstech website. You will find many of these uh, scholarship opportunities, many mobility uh, domain, and also lots of these events which we are organizing in member states. Uh, I'm extremely grateful uh, to UpSign uh, for being partner to these efforts at Pakistan Ac Academy of Sciences also. I'm also grateful to all uh, speakers and I'm eagerly looking forward to have your deliberation and I'm sure that this would be a very important and also an extremely meaningful dialogue which we'll initiate today. With this, I'd like to uh, hand over uh, to the next uh, speaker and let me, uh, uh, let me go back to Dr. Khalid. I think he is moderating the whole event. Thank you, Dr. Khalid. Thank you so much, Professor Iqbal Chaudhary. Your leadership uh, since you joined the, uh, the Comstech, uh, uh, you have made uh, wonderful progress in connecting those dots. And as you know, the science is beyond the borders. So the challenges that we face, the world at the moment, it's our common challenges. And we just have seen the COVID. COVID is not the problem of one person. It's the entire planet is suffering at the moment. So without any delay, thank you so much again. I'll just move on to our facilitator for today, Professor Ikra Ahmed Khan, who is my teacher as well. So I would like to invite Professor Ikra Ahmed Khan, sir, please. Hey, thank you, uh, Professor Iqbal and uh, uh, Dr. Khalil Bahmood uh, for giving me this opportunity. Uh, I've been uh, associated with One Health programs, uh, largely from the lens of zoonosis, uh, 
that uh, the diseases which uh, get transmitted from animals to human. Uh, several years ago, National Academy of Sciences, uh, United States uh, partnered with Pakistan Academy of Sciences and uh, we ran a, a series of uh, uh, cohorts of uh, uh, fellows uh, who were trained uh, as uh, uh, trainers of the trainers uh, in one were also partnered with the University of Kentucky in running a One Health uh, training and capacity building program. And there were partners in uh, Malaysia and uh, uh, in Thailand and in Kenya. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I, I'm biased in another way that uh, One Health is not just zoonosis. Uh, we have uh, uh, a continuum of uh, uh, ecosystem which uh, challenges the health uh, uh, of human being and uh, zoonosis certainly has become very significant uh, uh, in the past uh, uh, one year or so after COVID-19. Uh, but uh, just as a spanner, I would like to say that uh, the soils are deficient in zinc and iron, so are the animals and the human beings. So, so One Health uh, probably needs to uh, look at uh, another uh, opportunity of uh, uh, ecosystems uh, becoming part of uh, uh, One Health challenge. So with this uh, uh, quick uh, uh, statement of mine, I would like to invite the first uh, speaker of the day, uh, Professor Fiona Tomley. Uh, since we are short of time and a very tight schedule, I would ask all the speakers that uh, they give their quick introduction, uh, which is also actually uh, screened on the uh, in the PowerPoint uh, you are seeing on your uh, screens. But uh, it would be appropriate if uh, the speakers begin with their quick introduction. So we welcome uh, uh, Professor Fiona Tomley. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Khan, for that introduction, and thank you, uh, Hamoud, for the invitation. Um, in the interest of time, I think I will move quickly to um, share my screen and start the presentation. Okay, is that on your screens now? Yes, please. Okay, thank you very much. So I'm going to talk today about um, the programme that I am um, that I am leading, which is called the uh, GCRF Global Health uh, Global Challenges Research Fund One Health Poultry Hub. This is one of twelve interdisciplinary hubs that are funded by UK Research and Innovation, um, funded from 2019 running through to 2024. Uh, and on your screen is just a little map of, of where we are working. Um, and I'm going to skip through this quite quickly, but it is quite a big project. It's 20 million pounds um, at FEC um, and there are 27 partner institutions involved. So why are we working uh, in this area? Well, I think um, you know, we're all very aware that uh, the spark for a program like this is really uh, to do with um, to do with um, the fact that the expanding world population continues to in, uh, sorry continues to um, demand increases in food production and the remarkable escalation that there's been in the production of livestock animal protein over the last uh, three decades, four decades or so. And poultry, meat, and eggs are now the biggest source of protein for humans. And it's a major challenge to achieve sustainable growth. Uh, you can see here um, the sort of very, very rapid growth in blue of poultry generally, and the vast majority of that being made up by chicken production. And the figures on the right are the most recently available from uh, FAO, and you can see the numbers are really quite remarkable growth. Um, but the, the impetus for this particular program came back in uh, early 2017 when we had a stakeholder meeting in Sri Lanka attended by poultry scientists and producers from, uh, from the region. Um, and as well as identifying what the top infectious diseases were affecting flocks, and there's no surprises here, influenza, Newcastle disease, et cetera, through to the, uh, some of the bacterial and parasitic diseases. Um, at the meeting, we were also able to identify what were the major issues for the poultry producers in the, in the area. And again, you know, um, very uh, big issues to do with the cost of chicks, the, the genetics of the breeds, um, the quality of feed, how to manage waste, shortages of water, shortages of cultivatable land for feed, etc., and the social physical infrastructures associated often with the very rapidly expanding industry. And also a number of 
health concerns, both animal health, but also public health concerns, chief amongst which are lack of surveillance and epidemiology, antimicrobial usage and antimicrobial resistance, which of course is quite rife within the poultry industry, emerging zoonoses, which of course we all know about zoonoses, uh, particularly now, and I'm not going to talk about COVID, but it has had a major impact on our programme, of course, um, uh, and we've been doing a lot of work on that. But um, what we were concerned about at the time of setting this up and still are concerned about is that um, poultry production is, of course, linked with potential pandemic influenza. And there are also a lot of issues to do with uh, antimicrobial resistance, gut health, spillover of food poisoning bacteria, especially Campylobacter jejuni. So um, if we think about the global consumption of chicken and how that's changed, uh, and is predicted to continue to change right up to 2030. Then, of course, you can see this is a heat map, and the darker the heat, the darker the, the color, the higher the rate of change that is occurring at the moment. And South Asia is very much at the at the the, the, the center of this at the moment. And of course, this maps pretty well onto the risk of zoonotic emerging infectious disease events. Now, this is not to say that all zoonotic disease is due to poultry. Of course, it's not. But the key issue here is that risk increases with human population density and its accompanying food production systems and the, the, the complexity and the interactions that people and animals and the environment are having and the pollution into the environment. It's quite remarkable that about 50% of the world's current population currently resides in this South and Southeast Asia region. And it's really precisely for that reason that the places where we are working, which I've highlighted on this map here, are within these, these, these regions of high population density. So we are working in two sites in India, in Gujarat and in Chennai, in Sri Lanka, in Bangladesh, and also in the northern part of Vietnam. Um, and the vision that we have for this hub is that we're aiming to look at ways to achieve sustainable intensification of chicken meat and egg production, whilst reducing risk to human and animal health and welfare. And the way that we are uh, doing this is we are developing cohorts of both researchers, but also stakeholders. Uh, so that's people within the industry, but also communities, people within government, within policy uh, and within um, other associations linked to the poultry production sector who can take forward this vision in a one health and interdisciplinary environment. Um, and when we set up the project, we had two major um, thoughts about where we can start to try and unravel some of the you know, huge complexities of poultry production. And, and the hypothesis that we put forward is that it is the process by which intensification occurs because it's having an impact on the population structure of the poultry and the dynamics within the structure, that this is creating conditions for the generation and dissemination of, of high impact uh, health hazards, including antimicrobial resistance, but also viral diseases and food poisoning bacteria. And we also hyp hypothesize that, that mitigation or, or prevention of these risks requires interventions to be implemented across different scales of production and distribution networks. So it's not just about technical fixes, making a vaccine, distributing a, a drug. It's much more to do with how you address the problem in a behavioral way, in a structural way, um, and really understand where the barriers are to improving um, improving the situation. And so to do this, we set about designing programs of interdisciplinary studies in order to try and identify what the constraints are to change and looking at how best to implement policies. Um, a really important point for the work that we're doing is that we wanted to be working in parts of, uh, of, of Asia which are at different stages of intensification. So that's one of the reasons why we selected the sites and the, the countries. It's also very important for us that we need to be able to apply the work that we're doing across a very wide range of different types of poultry production and distribution networks, because part of what we're doing is trying to make robust models that can predict how interventions are likely to be able to uh, be applied and how effective they're likely to be. And other, other things like having good research, key advice, et cetera, in order to, to move forward. Um, work on the pathogens that we're studying, 
on the chickens, on the humans, and considering the environment in which they are. So our sampling, um, biological sampling, is in chickens and in humans and in the environment that they're occupying. And similarly, the social science that we're doing is considering the whole production chain from the, from the day-old chick right through to the consumer and the, the policymaker who is involved in, in, in deciding uh, some of the regulatory frameworks. A very important point in red is that the programme of research, the, it's being developed sort of partly bottom up, partly top down, but through all the working groups that we have, when protocols are developed, when, oh, yeah. when methodologies are implemented, um, the work is replicated across many different study sites. And this is important so that we can build the data from a lot of different types of production, different cultural frameworks, and be able to use this to develop um, prediction, predictive algorithms that we can apply more broadly. And the main questions that we're asking is why or how does intensification increase risk? Why are certain processes or behaviours risky? And what are the best long-term solutions for safer and more secure poultry production? Um, very quickly, I mean, I'm not going to dwell on this, but we have a lot of different disciplines within the hub. Um, the biological sciences are really looking at how pathogens or genes encoding antimicrobial resistance, how do they emerge, persist, transmit and evolve within and between different uh, networks of chicken production. And that's, as I say, looking at chickens, people and the environment. The social sciences is really there's a lot of ethnography and a lot of econ um, economics looking at the impacts of different marketing structures, distribution structures, and different relationships on business decisions and human behaviors, because we want to understand why do people do things the way that they do them and what impact does that have on epidemiological risk? And then sitting across that is the modeling and there's a big modeling component to take the data sets that are generated so that we can really start to examine the patterns and emergent properties of disease risk in order to support the targeting of specific interventions. So the goal is to really look at causal links, not just studying them separately, but linking the socioeconomics and pathogen evolution and spread so that we can see where are the really high risk activities and how to target interventions. We do this through four programmes. Um, you can find all this on our, our website, but basically um, there's a lot of work packages all within these different programmes. We're mapping the, the, the networks, looking at the flow of chickens, the dynamics, the spatial distribution of all the farms in the regions that we're studying uh, and looking at all of the different roles and actors within the, these, these networks. There's a very big program, program two, which is essentially deep sequencing the diversity of pathogens that we're seeing in these networks that we're studying, looking at the microbiomes, looking at the antimicrobials that are going into the farms, looking at the tissues from the birds so we can calculate the decay and the residues of those antimicrobials. Uh, it's a big program on host genetics, um, and all of this is put together at the end with a lot of phylogeographic um, analysis and modelling. We do have a flexible fund, um, and this is open for people to uh, collaborate with us for looking at um, developing projects um, that are complementary to what we're doing. And then there's also a big program on, on impact, so impact communication, uh, engagement, etc. So um, this is my last slide, and basically just want to sort of highlight that this is what we're about. This is our sort of algorithm. We are really here trying to develop integrated working through a One Health approach, um, looking for One Health solutions. Uh, we're very specifically in poultry, um, working with others and looking for collaborations and, and partnerships. And we are interested all the way from production to distribution and to consumption. And if I may, I just have one final slide. That's my last sort of slide for the talk. But um, I just wanted to highlight that we are running a roadmap series. Um, we have fortnightly uh, discussions. They're on a Wednesday morning UK time. Um, they're focused on a number of different themes. The next two that are coming up um, are in January and February. On uh, They are very poultry specific. The first one on gender dimension on the 20th of Jan. The second on vaccination challenges on the 3rd of February. Um, if you want information, um, if you go to our website, onehealthpoultry.org, it's all there. You'd be very welcome to join us in this roadmap series. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Tomley. Uh, very impressive uh, presentation. You just used one extra minute, but uh, you have uh, covered uh, a world of uh, uh, ideas and information talking about uh, poultry consumption intensification, your four programs, and I'm very uh, uh, impressed by your 
approach uh, of connecting uh, poultry to people. Uh, all right, so we move on to the next speaker, uh, Professor Munir Iqbal. Professor Munir Iqbal, over to you. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we yes. can hear you. Yes, yeah. you. And I tried to share, but I don't know why the... Uh, Ari, Aki, we can see it. Can oh, see. You can see it. Oh, that's yes, excellent. Is there. Yes. <laughs> that's excellent. So my name is Munir Iqbal and I'm working in Purbright Institute at UK. So we are working to understand how avian influenza viruses emerge and then spread in poultry and then gain um, zoonotic potential. Yeah. So uh, you just yes. need to go back to your uh, uh, well, screen. screen has uh, disappeared. Yeah. So if you go A back screen? to your PowerPoint, yeah. Oh. Your PowerPoint is not showing up. You're showing their screen, blank screen. Can you, can you see now? Yes. Yes. Oh, thank you. So I will not take much time. So why is not that? That's good. Okay, thank you. So the avian influenza viruses, um, of course, um, are infecting many, many um, animals and uh, even humans. And these uh, viruses uh, prevalent in many kind of a wild birds and they have a different kind of a um, subtypes. We called it as H1 to H16 and they are in uh, birds, as especially the wild uh, aquatic birds. I just do the point. So they can go to the poultry and some are established in humans like H1N1 and H2, H3, and then the other one um, for poultry, mainly the problem is H5, H7, H9, and H6. And among these, uh, currently the H5, they are hovering in uh, Europe, as well as in H9, they are really uh, half of the bird population in the world. They are um, um, kind of a unseen disease, I would say, but they are causing huge uh, economic um, burden to, to poultry production. Um, so as you can see, even for the H5 viruses, uh, in last few years, uh, there is a over 2 billion birds were died and uh, the economic losses which can be seen on the front is it's called two, uh, 200 billion dollars, but actually the hidden are much, much more in the poultry chain. So the major risk of the poultry, of course, um, which is unseen is a very few, although it says that H5 and 1 cause only 860 deaths compared to COVID. But the problem is the people stop eating when they see that their disease is in, in the bird. And that's what happened in which H7 and 9 in China, which remain a threat for a few years or most six, seven years. Um, and currently H9 and 2, although it is causing a very small disease in human, let's say every month one, uh, one person infected is being reported. But in the behind the scene, the, the, the damage to the poultry is, is too much, I would say. So as you can see, the bird, the, the viruses can move from one place to another through a migratory bird. And uh, currently, uh, every day, virtually in UK and Europe, the, the infection has been reported. And, and, and you can see these uh, in last two weeks, um, about 11 countries in Europe, they have uh, reported disease, uh, including UK, uh, in the last, let's say, Less than uh, 20 days, um, 400,000 birds uh, were died or called in only a small country, which is Netherlands, and, and a damage to the poultry in a small country like um, Netherlands, uh, they are saying is a huge, huge economic damage. Um, so when the virus move and they, they resort, um, the genetic changes happen and they, they expand their um, host range which is uh, within the poultry. So for example, if the birds are in a 
wild bird they can um, adapt to the poultry and vice versa similarly they are uh, changing their genetic and antigenic changes so the vaccine can fail uh, and the third thing which is the major impact to the one health uh, which is these viruses change their uh, receptor binding affinity and they can infect to human for example in this case as you can see that they uh, the receptor for human like H1N1, which is only bind to the human receptor, whereas uh, the pandemic one can bind to both uh, avian and, um, uh, and human. And this is a typical uh, kind of a receptor binding, which H7 and 9, which can bind to human receptor as well as the avian receptor. So that, that virus therefore causing disease in, in both human uh, as a zoonotic uh, infection as well as in poultry. But the other thing what happened is this virus which emerged, it only caused disease, clinical disease in human, but not in bird. So that become a more difficult to, to actually address. Uh, so why the farmer will cull their birds while it is not causing that disease. And that's what happened that um, uh, for a few years, um, this virus was causing disease in China in human, but not into the bird, but the bird are being culled and the, the farmer was not happy that their healthy birds are being culled. So in, in, in then 2017, when the high path of this virus, uh, the phenotype arise, and then they implemented the vaccination. And then the vaccination, what happened is it reduced um, the circulation of virus in, in birds uh, at the same time, the, the reduction of uh, human infection also um, are reduced. So very little uh, since 2017, 18, 19, until now, very few human uh, infection has been reported. So, so, but the virus still circulating in, um, in poultry. So we ask that why it happened that now the, the um, the virus is not uh, causing zoonotic infections. So we uh, studied the receptor binding and we saw that the wild type bind both a uh, human and uh, avian receptor, whereas the mutant viruses which um, arise after vaccination are uh, only bind to the poultry or uh, avian uh, receptors and not the human. So the virus also change uh, on, on a better way uh, rather than the, uh, the other way. But at, so, so basically when the virus emerge, it can infect poultry as well as human when vaccination um, uh, introduce the virus change and um, it lost the receptor binding affinity to infect human but continue uh, into the poultry. So we uh, are also looking how H9 and 2 are changing their receptor binding affinity for avian and human. So we. Um, characterize the viruses from Pakistan, Bangladesh, uh, Vietnam, and China. And we can see a different pattern uh, of these viruses which are binding to human uh, or, or avian receptors. Um, and, and as you can see, the, the viruses we isolated from Pakistan, um, about 55 viruses we analyzed um, uh, during the last few years. Uh, and we saw some of the strain carry this mutation, which we call 180T or V, and this mutation increased the receptor binding to human uh, compared to the previous virus, which has a little um, uh, receptor binding affinity for human. And then we also find the viruses which uh, have uh, some deletion in the HA gene, which also bind uh, very strongly to the human receptor. And these viruses are isolated from Pakistan and Nigeria. So uh, also from the database, database, we can see that a lot of viruses carry this mutation. So these viruses, if become prominent, this may cause um, more infection to human as a zoonotic pathogen. So in summary, I would say that um, several mutation can impact to the, to the virus, increase their virulence, increase their receptor binding affinity, 
and, and then of course they they affect uh, uh, these changes can can cause both impact to human and animals so the way forward is continue surveillance and identification of these emerging novel va variants and then map their antigenic and receptor binding properties so we can actually um, uh, can get some kind of warning that some novel viruses are emerging, which may have a zoonotic infection. And then the, of course, if we use effective vaccines, uh, antigeny match, they can reduce the virus load from the environment. So thank you very much. And a um, lot of uh, people and uh, also much of this work is uh, Professor Fiona Tomlesh, uh, I am a part of this uh, One Health Poultry. So we are working under the, uh, that umbrella to, to uh, interrogate what's happening in avian influenza in that region, including Pakistan, with Vietnam, uh, China, uh, and um, with um, Bangladesh. And also I have the ZELS project, which is in Vietnam and Pakistan. And this work thank was you, done. Thank, under, you, under, under, well, thank you very thank much. You very uh, another interesting talk about poultry. Now we move on to our next speaker. Uh, actually, two of them who will be sharing the stage, uh, Dr. Ahmed Razvi and uh, Dr. Asaf. So over to you, uh, Dr. Razvi. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you for Dr. Khalid and the Upside Network for inviting us along to speak to you today. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. Uh, if, if I could just ask uh, the previous speaker to, to cancel their sharing. Thank you. Yeah, I just finished. Thank you. Okay. Great. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, so please, could you confirm that you can see uh, the slides? You can see. Yes. Okay. yes. Thank you very much. So to introduce myself, my name is Dr. Ahmed Razavi. I am a consultant in global public health with Public Health England, and I am part of the senior leadership uh, team for the UK IHR St International Health Regulation Strengthening Project. Joining me today is uh, Dr. Asif Bittani, who is our health advisor in Pakistan, and he'll give you a bit of the flavor of what exactly we are doing in Pakistan. So, so far you've heard about the animal health side of things, but you haven't heard much from a human health perspective. And uh, as a medical doctor, and Asif as well as a, as a medical doctor, we can give you a bit of a flavor of how that human health and animal health uh, intersect with one another and what work we are doing from a human health perspective, but with a One Health lens. Uh, so our project, first of all, is to essentially strengthen the compliance of various different countries with the international health regulations, uh, which are part of the World Health Organization. Um, and part of this UK aid funded project is to strengthen global health security through increasing compliance with the international health regulations. This is an overview of the project, but I won't dwell on it for too long because I, I want to focus on the Pakistan aspect of this and focus on the One Health. So I'll skip past this. And this is a, a map of where we work. So as you can see, Pakistan is one of our, our key countries where we have been working. Uh, Pakistan and Nigeria are the oldest countries that we've been working with. How we work, and this is very key. One Health is really an approach which underpins all of what we do because it's all about systems coordination. It's all about making sure that the right people are in the right place at the right time and are having those conversations that are needed to ensure that we are understanding things from a broad range of perspectives, from a human health perspective, from an animal health perspective, from an environmental health perspective as well. And without those conversations, and um, if we continue to work in silos, then we won't be successful or effective at preventing zoono zoonotic diseases, or increasing global health security, which ultimately is the aim of our project. And as you'll hear that there are many different labels under which uh, a One Health approach can be fitted. And the approach we've taken in Pakistan, which I will uh, hand over to Dr. Asif to describe, is essentially to create a multi-sector outbreak response plan. And that very much has a One Health approach. So I'll hand over now to Dr. Asif to, to speak a bit more about the Pakistan side of things. Thanks, Ahmed. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Asif Vitani. I'm Health Advisor for Public Health England uh, here in Pakistan. You're all very welcome to this session. Now, um, uh, I'm cautious of the time and I'll be quick, but I just have to run through the history of how PHE ended up in Pakistan. Ahmed has elaborated on a few of the things, but uh, specifically to Pakistan, 
the international health regulations 2005 all member states are bound to implement the strategy uh, the, the the framework of ihr uh, well, Pakistan was struggling a bit, and that was the reason several countries and several organizations were uh, asked to guide Pakistan on uh, implementation of IHR. Hence, PHE uh, ended up in Pakistan, and uh, the strategy which PHE advised for Pakistan is Integrated Disease Surveillance and Response System. So, a three-pillar approach was adopted for uh, implementing this, uh, this uh, program. Uh, there are plenty of functions in that, but uh, just like Ahmed dwelled on, I will uh, focus on mainly on multi-sector outbreak uh, planning. Now, uh, just like the name suggests, integrated disease surveillance and response system. So uh, one, one aspect of uh, the disease surveillance, uh, the, the, the whole program is surveillance of the disease. The other aspect is the response portion. Now, uh, those who have been working in Pakistan, they would know that coordination was the biggest gap in, uh, in outbreak responses in Pakistan, uh, which which uh, bridge to general in every field. So. Uh, Identifying this gap, uh, what we did was we, uh, a PHE with the help of government, developed a multi-sector outbreak plan in order to uh, make the sectors coordinate, not only the health sector coordinate within itself, but with the other sectors. This becomes especially important uh, in case of, for example, uh, crimean carbuncle, hemorrhagic fever, or influenza. Uh, we have been uh, uh, observing the outbreaks of crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever. Now, uh, uh, most of uh, the participants will know that uh, the source of crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever is hylomatic, which resides on animals. Uh, it can directly bite the human, or uh, a human can get infected with the contaminated blood or tissue of uh, the animals. So unless, the, in order to respond to the outbreaks or the alerts of crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever, unless the uh, livestock sector is involved, the source cannot be contained uh, that effectively. Like health can treat the humans, but for source, it is inevitable to involve the health sector. Likewise, uh, for influenza, uh, what happens is if the livestock sector and human, they don't share data with each other, if the livestock doesn't share their data of um, uh, 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 birds dying of some unknown disease, uh, the health sector cannot become cautious of, of uh, of uh, that side of uh, the, 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 the disease. So uh, keeping these things in view, uh, what we did was uh, we involved all the sectors, interviewed them, uh, did lots of collaboration, did orientation sessions, and finally uh, came up with a plan which is based on the legislation which is called Public Health Act 2017. Uh, this, this plan was entirely based on that uh, legislation but all of the uh, rest of the sectors, they were all involved, including environmental protection agency, uh, food and water safety, uh, disaster management authority, and uh, things like that. So um, uh, the achievements that we did so far, uh, we have conducted at least three orientation sessions. We are eyeing on uh, another training in March, and our eventual goal would be uh, to develop a, an all hazard plan. Uh, you know, this uh, multi-sector outbreak plan, this uh, restricts to uh, uh, communicable diseases, but our eventual plan would be uh, an all-hazard plan, which would include non-communicable as well as other events. So that was all about uh, multi-sector outbreak plan. Uh, the rest of the areas, I'll quickly go over uh, those areas, whatever we're doing in Pakistan, is uh, workforce development. So uh, after identifying the knowledge, uh, the gaps in the knowledge, we developed a six module training, uh, uh, training uh, uh, module for uh, Pakistan uh, with collaboration, uh, in collaboration with WHO, CDC, and Ministry of Health. Now uh, we have conducted two training of trainers uh, uh, workshops in which we have trained 60 master trainers. Uh, one important thing is all these master trainers belong to government sector, like they are, they are from public sector because we wanted to have a sustainability in the system. So we picked only those who are working already with the government. So far in our 11 pilot districts, we have trained 850 healthcare workers. Likewise, uh, uh, in view of COVID, uh, we trained uh, nine points of, at nine point of entries, we trained two, 280 uh, uh, healthcare workers. Then uh, going on to public health laboratories, uh, if you can switch the slide, thank you. Uh, so uh, uh, there was a single laboratory in Pakistan that was a public health laboratory uh, at the national level, but we uh, wanted to have uh, uh, provincial uh, uh, public health laboratories. So uh, uh, we, we helped KP government to develop a public health laboratory, then we strengthened it, we developed the protocols and uh, uh, 
all kind of uh, SOPs for th th these laboratories. And we are eyeing on developing a network of laboratories for which we have completed audit in every district of one of the provinces in Pakistan. And uh, we'll be uh, uh, replicating this in other provinces as well. Uh, my last uh, thing would be uh, regarding surveillance and data, uh, data flow. So uh, there was no priority list in Pakistan. We developed uh, a list of priority diseases that included zoonosis, uh, uh, waterborne diseases, uh, vector-borne diseases, and kind of, we had a consensus of all the experts from all the uh, provinces on that. And now uh, we are going to train uh, one complete province, Sin province, all public health care uh, facilities, the health workers in there will be training them on uh, these, these uh, disease case definitions and all protocols of surveillance. Thank you very much if you have any questions. Thank you. Thanks very much, Asif. Uh, like Asif has said, if you have any questions, please do get in touch. Uh, we're happy to expand any further on any of the project work that we're doing, especially around One Health. Uh, thank you very much. Back to the chair. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Dr. Much. Zavi, uh, Dr. Asif, and you have given a different uh, outlook of One Health program. So now I request uh, Dr. Khalil Mahmood to introduce the next two speakers uh, in a row. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Ikra, and thank you so much, uh, Ahmed, uh, just bringing the human element part of the discussion. It's really interesting to see how we put these things together. So over to our next speaker, Professor Dr. Sabul Agun from Bashkent University, Turkey. Uh, she's a professor of medicine and uh, public health and uh, have over 30 years of experience. And I'm so grateful to Professor um, Sabul for giving her time today. She was in another meeting. Uh, she's uh, chairing a session in a conference and I asked her and she's going to join us in a minute. So over to you, Professor Sabul. Thank you so much again. Sabul? Uh, just to admin, see if Professor Sabul has got... Uh, um, co host properties here. Hello? Yes, we can see you here. Just have to say to you, unmute. Yeah. Uh, I'm trying to share my presentation, but unfortunately, it's not up. Is it okay now? Yes, it's coming. Yes. Perfect. Okay, it's coming. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, first of all, inviting me to this very important event. Uh, yes, today is a very busy day. We have two conferences at the same time, so I'm sorry for being late. I'm professor of public health and medicine, as you uh, said, in Turkey, uh, working as chief quality officer. But my talk will be totally different now because Dr. Uh, Halit requested for me to talk something on nutrition, and I I'm working also in nutrition area and PhD. So I will talk very briefly on nutrition and COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, actually, my time is very limited, so uh, I'm not going to the details on COVID-19. Everybody is very much aware indeed. Uh, so I will talk more on specific nutritional needs for specific population during COVID-19 and uh, measure impact of COVID-19 on nutritional status and habits. And I will give some recommendation, inshallah, if I can manage it within 10 minutes. So everybody knows COVID-19, I'm not going to talk, but just uh, it is uh, causing disease from a common cold to pneumonia and transit between humans, various maternal droplets. And now we are living such a different world. And uh, the WHO already declared it is a pandemic since March and everything changed. Today, 75 million people uh, infected by COVID-19, around 2 million deaths we have worldwide, and all our lifestyles, everything changed. And you know all the symptoms. The vulnerable groups are children, pregnant women, lactating mothers, elderly, but especially uh, the uh, malnourished group. And in future uh, virus pandemic, we might face double burden of malnutrition, now both under and over nutrition indeed. I'm not talking just about malnutrition, but also obesity is very, very, you know, very prevalent. Yeah, and uh, we have also some comorbidities, 
uh, you, we all know very well that the impact of COVID-19 is very high with regards to mm -hmm. outcomes for people living it's with pre-existing COVID co comorbid condition, such as hypertension, bronchitis, cancer, cardiovascular disease, so on. So, yes, uh, since March, we heard a lot about uh, social distancing, wearing masks, um, isolation, quarantine, lockdown, so on. But nutrition is very important because uh, to strengthen our immunity, to boost our immunity, nutrition is also a very important factor. And uh, we didn't discuss too much in the nutrition issues. So, if I uh, very briefly summarize some specific nutritional needs for specific population that I already mentioned, vitamin D is uh, one. Uh, so we all know that vitamin D reduces the risk of acute respiratory infection. Uh, the tolerable upper limit is uh, 4,000 international unit, and this supplementation is safe and protects against acute respiratory tract infection. Indeed, it is not proved yet that uh, vitamin D uh, really prevent uh, from uh, COVID-19 infection, but we all know that uh, vitamin D supplement uh, uh, really very helpful and reduces uh, the symptoms of uh, COVID-19. So I know that in many countries, for not in, in our case, but in UK, I know that uh, already the NHS started to uh, recommend the uh, intakes uh, around 200 to 600 international unit vitamin D. Another one, vitamin E, we call this as anti-infective vitamin indeed. And uh, this is also, um, reduce morbidity and mortality from infectious disease. We know this since many, many years, especially the measles, diarrheal disease, and measles-related pneumonia. I, I, my, uh, one of my area is child nutrition. So uh, for childcare, we always add this vitamin A supplement, especially during measles period. So uh, for COVID-19, it's not again uh, very clear, but we know from the animal studies, we know that vitamin A diets compromise the effectiveness of uh, inactive bovine coronavirus vaccines and render cows for more susceptible to infectious diseases. And the uh, recommended daily allowance around 900 males and 700 international units for females. Okay. Another one, vitamin C. Uh, vitamin C uh, also um, uh, is a good vitamin, uh, and we see a significant lower instance of pneumonia in vitamin C supplemented groups. So, suggests that vitamin C may prevent the susceptibility to lower respiratory tract uh, uh, infections, especially under COVID 19 conditions. And in animals, some of the animal studies. Uh, it, it was shown that it protects against infection caused by coronavirus and COVID-19 causes lower respiratory tract infection and vitamin C uh, is an effective choice as part of the treatment plan. Vitamin Bs are also important and, and they play a role in uh, energy metabolism of all cells and could enhance the killing of some uh, virus and bacteria and uh, also plays an important role by the immune function. Uh, and zinc, everybody knows the importance of zinc. And again, in child health, we use zinc uh, during, their, during the infection uh, disease uh, period. And it is very important, the maintenance and development of immune cells uh, and uh, zinc supplementation given to zinc deficient children could reduce misery related uh, pneumonia, Measles related morbidity and mortality caused by lower respiratory tract infections, and the recommended daily allowance is around 15 milligrams. So, uh, before Corona and after Corona, actually, many things changed not only in our uh, lifestyles, but also in our nutritional habits. And, and the retrospective analysis of data available on the 1980s Spanish influenza pandemic revealed that nutrition played a role in disease severity. 
what are the measure impacts? First of all, the, all those lockdowns, all the current reduced the physical activity uh, level also. So there's a perception of weight gain. And it's in some studies for the Italy on in uh, United States, it uh, shows that there's an increase in the weight gain. And there's, of course, disruption in food change. Uh, you know, or, uh, everything now uh, stop, everything locked down. So production, distribution, consumption, and limited access to daily grocery. So this is a reduction consumption of fresh fruits and vegetables in some countries. And uh, the outcome is some micronutrient deficiency. And of course, the income is uh, lower now, especially in developing countries. In our cases, the economy, our economy is, is not doing well. Uh, the prices uh, decrease, so uh, uh, the impact is the poor diet quality and uh, again stable cereal base uh, and the wasting and micronutrient deficiency. So uh, the reduction in intake of meat and uh, uh, on the other hand, believe in miracle foods to get rid of from of fear. So consumption of uh, ginger increase. Uh, so. Uh, 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 keto diet increase, thinking about food more than usual, allocate sufficient time to prepare take out food. But there are also some uh, good impact, uh, increase in homemade recipes. I mean, not the carbohydrates, but we are now eating more at home. So more healthy diets uh, when compared with the fast food, when compared with the uh, hamburger. But we have uh, under uh, uh, stress, so this is also one of the components. So many things change. So as I already mentioned, development of healthy food habits, reduction in eating out, uh, reduction in tendency of food waste, these are good uh, issues. So just uh, I want to give some recommendations because I see that I don't have uh, much time. So let me give some recommendation, WHO recommendation. Uh, so it is a recommended a diet with variety of food, unprocessed food, uh, you know, more vitamin, as I already mentioned, more, uh, you know, uh, fresh fruit and vegetable. Water is essential. So during COVID-19, drink at least eight, nine cups of water, uh, uh, consume fruit, vegetables more than before, eat unsaturated fats, avoid processed meats, avoid industrial foods, okay. So uh, fruits, vegetables, uh, the grains, and not more than five grams of salt. Fix uh, uh, your uh, diets, fix your portions, uh, and please be, uh, be careful uh, and uh, diverse to all uh, your diets. Always uh, follow the, our nutrition pyramid, consume more fruit, vegetables, uh, less uh, processed meats and foods. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Sewell, for your time. And I know it's a, such an interesting subject. We should have a whole uh, conference around the nutrition. It's a, such an important subject. So thank you so much again. Uh, Thank you for giving me this opportunity to meet thank your you so group. Much. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for joining from Turkey. I'll just move on to our next speaker uh, because we have a very tight agenda. Uh, usually I try to get my workshops or events done in uh, uh, one hour. So next speaker is uh, Dr. Zahida, Raz, uh, sorry, Dr. Zahida Fatima. So she's a principal uh, scientist at um, uh, Pakistan Academic Research Center. Zahida, please. Uh, uh, do I need yourself. to share my screen or uh, it yes, is please. already? Yeah. yeah, you go ahead. Or if you have, uh, I can just share from my end, but first um, and uh, no party advanced uh, multi participant can share it. Okay, let me stop mine and then you will be able to share your screen. Okay. Thank you. Just to let you know, I mean, a lot of people are trying to join the Zoom. Unfortunately, this Zoom had only 100 people limit. So if people are, their contacts wanted to join, they could use our YouTube link, which I just shared earlier. Otherwise, this event will be available uh, afterward as well. For I think I cannot share. Uh... Okay, let me then share my screen. I have here. Okay, you can so, share, no problem, to just to avoid the okay, time. Go ahead. Let's go ahead. Okay. Uh, okay. Good morning, good afternoon, and assalamu alaikum, everyone. Uh, which who don't know me, I am Dr. Zaida Fatma, working as uh, principal scientific officer 
at uh, Pakistan Agriculture Research uh, Council. I'm a veterinary epidemiologist. So um, from the uh, beginning of the this workshop, and I'm very much uh, um, uh, thankful to that sign and the construct for, for providing me opportunity to talk with you on a very important and very close to my heart subject, the One Health. So you guys, um, most of you know that the, what is One Health. The One Health is actually, it is it is not only a science, it's also, I will say, say the, uh, now the, it will be the life science. It is the collaborative efforts of multiple disciplinary, uh, disciplinary working locally, nationally, and globally to attain what is the uh, um, uh, over end point to attain the health, optimal health, not only for the people, for the animals, and the for environment as well. So it is encompassing the humans, wildlife, pets, livestock, and farming, and uh, many subjects. And now, um, first we were working in the, and I like this, um, uh, I have taken this slide from the One Health Sweden. I li like it very much because it is, and this umbrella is covering all many, many subjects, many, many disciplines, not only the human and animals and environment, they are also um, having the um, trans discipline, medicine, non-communicable diseases as well. There is some problem. Uh, uh, someone, my voice is okay. And ultimately the uh, goal of this uh, uh, protection umbrella is the protection of human and humanity in which comes the over um, humans, animals, environment, and many other things as well. Uh, next slide, please. So we uh, should not forget the three important C's of One Health, which I think very important, that, that One Health involves everyone, every discipline, because I told you that it is a transdiscipline, multidiscipline, interdiscipline, and we need to break the silos of all, all those sciences which were working already in their, in their uh, in their subject, but they were not connecting with each other. So very important, three C's of the One Health is that we need to collaborate, whether we are veterinarian, we are the agriculture workers, we are the policy maker, we need to coordinate, we need uh, to collaborate, and we need to communicate with each other. So what's going on in their fields and how can we share the data as um, many of the uh, previous speakers have discussed this thing that we need to share the data and we need to share our thoughts and we need to share our research work together to protect ourselves and our environment and our humans. And as far as the zoonot uh, one health is concerned, zoonotic diseases is the very much important uh, part of this one health. And most of you people, maybe they knowing the, what is the zoonotic disease that did spread between animals to humans. And also now we are seeing the reverse zoonosis in case of COVID that coming from the um, uh, humans to animals as well. So we need to uh, focus on the we, uh, uh, whether we are medical professionals, we are uh, ecologists, we are veterinarian. We need to focus on the zoonotic diseases, and we need to focus many other things. So what is the impact of zoonosis? Which I think very important that um, zoonosis is impacting not only overall health of the uh, or in the globe, it is threatening the health of animals, so resulting in illness loss of productivity, death, and economic um, loss to the farmers who are rearing and loss of the people who are having in, in this business, then it threatens the livelihood of a large segment of the population. And also the important factor which are leading uh, to the emergence of these infections. You know that most of the, most than 70% infectious diseases who are being reported in human side, it is coming from the animal side. And wh wh why does it happen? Because you now the world is a global village. It's the overpopulation, urbanization, deforestation, deforestation and water and sanitation uh, problems and agriculture, extens extensive land use. All these factors are leading to the increase zoonotic diseases, increase one health problems. All oh, these are the basic things. I just wanted to tell you a bit. Uh, I will give a snapshot what's going on in the initiatives going on in for so far in Pakistan. This One Health uh, uh, relationship started back from the high path even influenza outbreak from uh, uh, not only from the 26 to 2000, but it was uh, started uh, as I uh, I'm working in the federal organization. So we were having a very very active collaboration in that scenario with the uh, National Institute of Health. Then we had some previous project uh, with the uh, NIH and the other institutes in the uh, in the Pakistan. They were funded by the World Bank and Massey University and uh, CCHF and brucellosis. Then we had a very strong 
right now we are having very strong collaboration with the PRC and NIH. We had an MAU and all the other institute, whether it is academia or other research institute in the in Pakistan and national and international as well. There is a one health hub at. Um, can you go back to the previous slide because I need to focus on that. Then we um, there uh, their antimicrobial resistance uh, um, project is going on and then the zoonotic lab assessment, and then there are many projects are going on, non, not only in PRC, in NIH and other institute as public health England people have already told you. So in the after 2010, uh, which I see that many, many collaboration and many, many uh, uh, coordination and uh, communication are going on between the different sectors. So Pakistan One Health initiatives are, uh, it's, it's limitless, like it, uh, it is involving the uh, uh, institutes, in not only inside the country, but outside the country as well, and also the academia as well. Next slide, please. Uh, and this, these are the initial um, uh, just uh, uh, progress which we started in back in 20, 2012, which I told the Pakistan One Health Initiative, then in that, uh, uh, in that project, the Pakistan National One Health Symposium was conducted and One Health Hub was, uh, of Pakistan was also um, developed. Next slide. Next slide, please. So Pakistan One National One Health Platform has been officially established. At, uh, I'm telling all this which, uh, the, if the people who don't know about what's going on inside, even inside Pakistan. So it, it is established at NIH to prevent and control the zoonotic diseases, national and international concern, then had this hub is established at field epidemiology. And the ultimately goal is to have positive and active relationship and intersectoral coordination between human, animal, environmental, and other sectors as well. Next slide. Uh, Dr. Zaida, sorry to interrupt you. We just uh, time. I'm having so to you have given me too much less time. <laughs> okay, I'm just, I'm just. Uh, just uh, closing remarks, please. Uh, I think we just have. Okay, to okay. One so, uh, you. you know, the, uh, we have prioritized zoonotic diseases. Then uh, Dr. Ikrar has told you about the One Health uh, opportunities being a One Health fellow. Right, uh, right now, I'm also having three one projects on the One Health. So all these are glimpses of the project uh, of uh, my National Academy of Sciences in which I went to Kenya. And uh, we are, uh, I mean, uh, uh, I, I think the One Health is really a future to combat epidemics and pandemics in future. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Zahid, for your time. I'll just, uh, well, we just have run out of time. I know speakers might have gone away, but I just want to see if there's any important question. I just give a chance for one question and then I formally close this event. So any anyone want to raise their hand can, as a participant, and then I'll maybe let you to open up your mic. So otherwise I'll just, uh, Any question here? So, seems like people are happy with this. So with this, I would say, uh, we are just on time. I would say thank you so much for everybody for today's uh, event, especially to our foreign guests, uh, especially Professor Seville and Dr. Munir and uh, Professor Fiona, and uh, I would say guests who join from all over the world. Uh, with that, I would say Upsign is very keen to sort of connect with dots uh, who are interested in uh, making those collaboration. We are living in, in a, in the same village, it's a global village we are living in. So how we can uh, share knowledge and good practice. I'll just uh, uh, give it mic to our Fazek uh, Rahman to just uh, close this event formally. Thank you so much, everybody again. Well, thank you, Khalid, as you have already uh, closed it uh, very well. And uh, we have learned quite a bit and uh, we have basically created another platform for global uh, collaboration. And uh, uh, two countries uh, represented here today, particularly United Kingdom and Turkey, uh, very important experiences. And I'm very happy to hear that uh, the nutrition has been talked about because uh, my uh, earlier discussion in the past several years uh, have, uh, have been, uh, uh, you know, trying to rub in that nutrition is to be linked with this uh, bigger challenge of fun health. And uh, uh, Professor Sawal has uh, given us a, uh, overview of uh, that possibility. With this, uh, uh, thank you very much. I think uh, I wish we had more time and uh, more space for people to enter live, but maybe next time better one. And particularly through this forum, I would like to request uh, Professor Sawal to make ourselves available. We can uh, maybe do an independent event on nutrition.
definitely. Yes, definitely. Okay. Definitely, absolutely. Okay. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity meeting all of you. It's a great pleasure and honor for me. Thanks a lot. Yes, right. we need to have uh, another session. <laughs> Yes, yeah, it is. And I know I've been uh, uh, sort of in upside. Usually they say you have only one speaker. I think it was such an important subject. And today we have made a good progress. Once again, upside is there to keep those collaborations on, as Professor Kraus said. Let's work together and join hand working together. So with this, uh, look after yourself. Thank you so much. And, uh, and then our colleagues in the West who are preparing for uh, Christmas break, uh, Happy Christmas. And Happy New Year. So see you in New Year. Thank you so much again, Fiona and your team. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.